Winter is the time when I am at my best. I have very few symptoms and I also have more drive. It is really super interesting. As soon as the temperature goes down below 19 degrees, I come alive like this little penguin here. Feeling chipper and enthusiastic and having so much more energy than in summer. It's fascinating. It's like a light switch comes on in autumn when temperatures go down. So, if I could, I would completely delete summer and just have spring, autumn and winter all year long. That would be awesome. So I would feel all the time like this. This is a video about heat intolerance because now we have summer. Of course it is an issue if you have heat intolerance. All those symptoms are more pronounced. You feel exhausted, you might be in more physical pain, more muscle tensions, more anxiety, irritability, and when it gets too hot then you have hot flashes all the time, excessive sweating, of course sleep problems, and so on. Heat intolerance. What is it? What can you do about it? Well, it's a situation where you get overheated easily in warmer weather. You can either have a situation where you're sweating excessively, when you really shouldn't be sweating, or you're not sweating at all in hot weather. And when your body is in warmer weather, you may feel a little bit weak or dizzy. So heat intolerance is a symptom of various conditions. One, MS. Number two, something called POTS. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. What is that? That's a situation where your autonomic nervous system is not adapting that well. So when you're standing up, you get really dizzy and lightheaded, so you have to sit down. Number three, dysautonomia. This is a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, which this is one condition of this, but you can have a lot of other problems related to this right here. This autonomia also includes MECFS and mast cell activation syndrome, as well as fibromyalgia. Mast cells produce allergic responses, but mast cell activation syndrome is a very different kind of immune reaction. Despite the fact that mast cells were the first immune cells discovered, mast cell activation syndrome is now just getting traction in the medical field, and that's why it's still quite difficult to get a diagnosis. Mast cell activation syndrome is basically a hypersensitivity disease. Maitland believes a hypersensitivity plays a role. She believes that trigger happy mast cells that are overreacting to all sorts of stimuli are the main problem in mast cell activation syndrome. And one of the triggers is heat in any form. But in general, the autonomic nervous system helps you adapt to certain things like stress, uh, temperature. So let's say, for example, you just get out of the shower and you get dressed 
and you break out in sweat. That would be one example. Another example is heat intolerance, failure to adapt to warmer environments. And number four, hyperthyroid conditions. So that can create a situation where you're intolerant to heat. What's interesting is all four of these conditions have a common thread. Low vitamin B1. When you increase vitamin B1, you can improve the symptoms of MS. Not just heat intolerance, but fatigue. Also, you can improve symptoms of POTS, dysautonomia, and symptoms of hyperthyroidism. I would recommend taking a good amount of this. Try to find a B complex that's natural, but a bit. The other nutrient that is beneficial, especially for MS, is vitamin D3. So that could be another thing that can help you. But realize that if you take too much vitamin D, you may have lower blood pressure. And many times with POTS, the person has very low blood pressure, so taking more vitamin D can drop your blood pressure even lower. Um, but vitamin D is great for people with high blood pressure. So in summary, B1 is very, very important. The other point I want to mention is the more carbohydrate that you consume, the more B1 that you're going to need. So it could be that when you also consume more carbohydrates, you have more of a symptom because it's going to aggravate and worsen the B1 deficiency. So what triggers this heat intolerance? It can be many things. So exercise is one. Walks are okay. Driving the bike is okay too, as long as it's not in summer. Wearing a mask, impossible, impossible, impossible. Massive stress reaction. And direct sunlight if it's in summer, I can get a rash even. Hot and humid weather, especially in countries where it's always quite hot, like Thailand, Malaysia, New York in summer. Once I tried the sauna because everybody said, oh, it's so healthy to sweat. Apparently not for my body. I got a rash and didn't feel so well afterwards, so I never went again. Yeah, and then you have the hormonal fluctuations, so estrogen will also be a factor. Fibromyalgia and temperature sensitivity and how temperature changes and things uh, affect us as fibromyalgia people patients, sufferers. Everybody knows that weather changes can be really awful for people with fibro. A lot of us know that we can expect a flare-up or just a worsening of our symptoms during times when the weather is changing. And it's not just a change in temperature, it's also a, t a change in atmospheric pressure. So um, just when the seasons are changing, basically. In, in terms of how the temperature itself can affect us, there's a bit the like wide range of things that people experience. Maybe it feels like you're burning up when you're exposed to the heat and like you will never be able to cool down. You are hot all the time. Most people find that there is one temperature that suits them better than the other. You do better in the cold, but it just seems like our bodies are unable to adapt to temperature changes in the way that healthy people do. Experiencing these, any of them or all of them, whatever, means that you are experiencing a symptom of fibromyalgia called temperature sensitivity. They don't know exactly what causes this symptom yet, but there's a lot of interesting research being done, and there's a few, a few studies that point us in a direction that is, I think, interesting and probably true. Much of the research that's being done points towards abnormalities in the autonomic 
nervous system, which deals with homeostasis, which is the body's ability to keep temperatures and other factors within normal ranges. The autonomic nervous system also deals with our body's reactions to different situations. Basically, the autonomic nervous system deals with the regulation of involuntary body functions, which ranges from blood pressure, digestion, body temperature, our flight or fight reaction, and a lot of other things like our bodily fluids, um, etc, etc, etc. So this means that researchers are now able to look deeper into this system to figure out exactly what is going on and are finding really interesting things. So some research shows that fibromyalgia patients show abnormal body temperature, an inability to adapt to changes in temperature, and a lower pain threshold to both heat and cold stimuli. This means that it takes less extreme temperature to make us feel pain or discomfort from the temperature. The nerves that feel temperature are not the same ones that feel pain. We have an entirely separate system of nerves that senses temperature. These nerves are on our blood vessels, and scientists used to think that these nerves dealt only with blood flow. So it turns out that these special nerves don't just adjust our blood flow, they actually also detect temperature. So these nerves then became a logical target for fibromyalgia research since we're known to have both blood flow abnormalities and temperature sensitivity. And sure enough, researchers found that fibromyalgia participants in the study had extra temperature sensing nerves along special skin blood vessels called AV stunts. And these uh, little special vessels are in our hands, in our feet, and on our face. Basically, their job is to increase blood flow into your extremities when you are cold so that your fingers and your feet and your face don't freeze. This is the first study looking at how this system is involved in our illness. Obviously we can't say for sure that it's accurate, but it does set an interesting path uh, and direction for more research to be done. It does seem to be an explanation that makes a lot of sense. Now speaking of the impact of the heat specifically, there are a few things that happen to us. Uh, firstly, some of us don't regulate sweat as well uh, as healthy people do. This means that our bodies have a hard time cooling down. And interestingly, this actually supports the research that I've just talked about because the autonomic nervous system does regulate our sweat and our uh, bodily fluids. And the fact that we have a hard time regulating sweat also explains why we are more prone to having fevers, heat rashes, or heat stroke. Another thing that contributes to the struggle with the heat, that we become very easily dehydrated, which would also explain why we get so many headaches and why our fatigue gets so much worse in the heat. The last thing that I want to mention about the heat is that it also makes it hard to sleep, and we all know that not sleeping well really aggravates our symptoms, so that might be why some people in the heat feel like their symptoms get aggravated. Other things that may contribute to our temperature sensitivity are hormonal imbalances and certain medications, especially in women. We're so lucky. I feel like most of the evidence that we do have points to support this study that has been done. Although this research is really good for us, you know, it's good that people are looking into it and it's good that they're finding things that are interesting and that are motivating them to do more research and to find out more things, it doesn't actually mean that there is any way to deal with it yet. Also, we can't really control the weather, so, you know, we're always going to have to cope with the symptom, kind of. But I do have some suggestions for things to do to deal with it, I guess. Here are some things that may help. If you're always hopping between temperatures, you know, if you are, you go from feeling really hot to really cold really quickly, uh, wearing a lot of layers is probably going to be helpful to you because you can adjust yourself to how you're feeling. Uh, and you can take off layers and put them back on as you know you feel is necessary. Always staying hydrated, and I know I talk about this all the time, but always staying hydrated, especially in the summer. In the winter, having lots of hot drinks, you know, uh, especially hot tea. Personally, I like tea. I don't like drinking coffee. I like coffee, but I can't drink coffee because it makes me, you know. Anyway, but drinking a lot of tea not only, you know, helps you with the hydration, but it also keeps you warm, you know, it warms your hands, it makes you feel warmer inside, so it's a nice way to deal with the cold. Also, when it's cold, making sure that you are wearing enough clothes or like maybe a little bit more than you need to, especially in your extremities. So gloves, really warm socks and really good shoes and hats and things on your head to keep you from getting cold. In the summer, keeping your house really cool by closing the shutters and 
the windows so you're not letting the hot air in and in the winter opening the windows uh, maybe not actually opening the windows but opening the shutters to let the sunshine in and let it warm your house another thing is considering the investment of an AC unit if you don't have one already or if you don't have you know heating and things um, I feel like AC is like a way to do both things and you just have to invest in that one thing but obviously it depends on where you live and you know what what you feel is necessary but I find that having AC is a lifesaver for me. Another thing that I write about is employing relaxation techniques to help you with the cold. In a study they found that when and I am trying to get this under control so this summer will not be so much torture. I will definitely buy a cooling system at least for the bedroom so at night I can sleep and not sweat but I also started to include some supplements that are supposed to help this was about two weeks ago Heat intolerance is a disability in my book. You really suffer with additional symptoms. You feel more tired, more anxious, more irritated. Stomach is upset. Body can't cool down. Constant hot flashes. Sweat pouring down. It is torture. I might try a histamine blocker this summer to see if quality of life is improved. So far I have not done that because right now it's not really that hot and I'm not so keen taking those histamine blockers because they have side effects especially for the nervous system it can be harmful and all i'm trying to do is repair the nervous system histamine blockers may lead to cognitive impairment problems with focusing dementia inner unrest and so on. So I'm rather careful with that. But since I developed burning mouse syndrome through mask wearing, that was forced upon me. I didn't do that voluntarily. I just had to work so what do you do right yeah but now i have a mask exempt and i no longer will wear a mask anywhere but what they say that naturopathic pain is pain that is caused by disease or damage to the nervous system the use of hormones is one of the newest and innovative ways to treat not only burning mouse syndrome but to treat pain that is called neuropathic pain and definitely the cortisol was elevated and progesterone was low so Right now I'm trying this progesterone cream it's worth a try. So I have looked into this. So today we're going to talk about an interesting hormone, progesterone. So many women are focused on estrogen because they're estrogen dominant, but progesterone is the opposing hormone. Okay, so they work together. Uh, during menopause, you have a severe drop in progesterone in relationship to estrogen. So progesterone drops even more. And progesterone is important because it's, it's kind of like a pre-hormone that is there to help turn into other hormones like estrogen, 
and even cortisol and some of the other adrenal hormones. So it's very, very important, especially during menopause, because if you get the severe drop in progesterone, you may not have enough to make the adrenal hormones that are necessary to even compensate for the loss of the ovarian hormones. So you end up having various symptoms, uh, vaginal dryness, atrophy, uh, thinning skin, loss of collagen, decreased libido, hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, and feeling irritable. Other than that, you're perfectly fine. Yep, I have um, So things. progesterone has a calming effect. It relaxes uh, a, a female. It also uh, it's great to take uh, in the evening, so when you go to bed, you can actually sleep better. It's also a diuretic, so when you're low on progesterone, you'll get fluid retention. And progesterone is intimately involved in almost every part of the menstrual cycle and also involved with pregnancy. And if you increase stress, that can suppress progesterone too. Another reason why ah, someone might have a low progesterone level that is not going through menopause or maybe is going through menopause and the added stress brings it down even further. Um, one thing you need to know is that cholesterol is the key element to help someone build up progesterone. So if you're on okay. a low fat diet or a low cholesterol diet or a statin, that could be the reason why you don't have enough progesterone. It can really throw off the hormones. Wow. Um, one of the I best remedies the is uh, wild yam extract. Okay, You'll see wild yam in an over-the-counter progesterone cream. Now in the lab, wild yam extract does have a chemical that turns into progesterone. But in humans, um, they have not found that it actually really turns into progesterone. So they don't know exactly why, but the, the properties, the phytochemicals or nutrients in wild yam seem to improve these symptoms right here. It seems to mimic uh, progesterone. And again, you're not actually taking progesterone cream. You're taking something that mimics it in a more of a natural way that seems to uh, create these very cool effects by improving these things. And when you take the cream, uh, I would I would not recommend putting it on the inside of the uh, wrist right here because it goes in too fast. Uh, rotate putting it in one thigh and then the other thigh and maybe in the buttocks because that way you'll have like more of an insulation and it can act as more of a time release. So it goes in a little bit slower than going into the wrist, which goes in like a rocket ship that you'll get the spike. And find a brand that has good reviews. Now, as far as the dosage goes, I would follow what it has on the directions because each brand has their own um, concentration. So just to give you the basics, we have this little gland in your brain called hypothalamus. And there's a certain part of the hypothalamus that is controlling the release of the egg from the ovaries every month in your cycle. So it controls the menstrual cycle, and it works through this um, pituitary gland, which is kind of like the middleman. What happens is when you start menstruating, let's say you're, I don't know, 12, 13 years old, and every month you're releasing an egg, and you're releasing an egg, and roughly about 400 eggs you have. Okay, so when you exhaust 400, roughly you should be around 52 years old. And then your uh, ovaries should stop working because you're probably not planning on getting pregnant. And so you lose the ovarian function. And with that comes a loss of certain hormones. When you lose the ovary and its hormones, thank goodness you have a backup organ called the adrenals. The adrenals make the same hormones as the ovaries, just not in the same amounts, the same quantities. During menopause, certain things can happen hot flashes, night sweats, anxiety, depression, stress, muscle loss, bone breakdown, all these things can happen. So there's various things that you can do to improve this whole thing. Typically, the, the first thing I would tell people to do is to strengthen the backup organ, the adrenals, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of things you can do, especially to make sure you're sleeping, make sure your stress is low, um, because we want to reduce cortisol, okay? And, and that may just solve the whole thing. The major storage site for vitamin E is the pituitary. So when you lose this cycle, okay, many times you can drop your vitamin E levels. And vitamin E is needed for all of these sex hormones. So one remedy for hot flashes that's pretty effective is to take a very high quality vitamin E complex, including all the tocopherols 
and all of the tocotrienols together as one complex. Now, the other thing that works for hot flashes is taking iodine from sea kelp. Why? Because this helps estrogen dominance. Now, this is kind of strange because as you age, estrogen should decrease. It does. But the other opposing hormone called progesterone really takes a nosedive. So we have this relative severe progesterone deficiency with a moderate amount of deficiency with estrogen. And if we look at that ratio, it will give you an estrogen dominance. Ah, and so there's estrogen that's not a, being opposed or countered. It creates problems in this circuitry right here. Not to mention, if you have extra body fat, that body fat can then make more estrogen too after menopause and give you even more estrogen. So taking iodine can really work if you have an estrogen dominant situation. But there's some other things that also work for estrogen dominance. So let's talk about the liver. Now, the big purpose of the liver is to detoxify chemicals, poison, heavy metals, and excess hormones. It removes hormones if there's an excessive amount of them as an estrogen dominance. It will also remove excess amounts of cortisol. There's too much, but it can only do that if it's working. And the problem is when you reach age 52, many times the liver is either fatty or it has problems and it's just not working efficiently. So another solution that really, really is effective is to support the liver if you have hot flashes, night sweats, and issues. Because if we can get the estrogen to a normal level, you can actually resolve the hot flashes and be able to sleep at night. The amazing remedy called calcium D-glucarate. Your body makes a little of this, but if the liver is not working, you might need more. You can get this as a supplement. I don't have a brand name to recommend. You can just look in different products and read the reviews. But what this compound does, it, it's very effective at helping detoxify estrogen and also ammonia if you, if you consume too much protein. Uh, one study, it shows that it decreases estrogen by 23% and it will decrease the receptors for estrogen by nearly 50%. Right there, it's going to pull you out of this estrogen dominant situation. It also increases the liver circulation with very minimal side effects, if any. So I just wanted to create this video to give you some options to look at if you have hot flashes and try different things. What can help to balance these three estrogens and give you more of the good estrogen and less of the bad? So it's more protective against things like breast cancer, uh, things like that. And lastly, vitamin E. A lot of the vitamin E is stored in the pituitary gland that actually controls the adrenal and controls the ovary. And so vitamin E drops significantly after menopause. So if you actually take enough vitamin E in the correct type, which I'm going to tell you in a second, you can support the adrenals and the ovaries and minimize a lot of these symptoms right here. The type of vitamin E that I would recommend is emu oil. Nature is stronger than any human design. The ingredients within foods work synergistically. They work as teams to feed cells. Isolated and synthetic vitamins contain only a fraction of the vitamin complexes and lack the cofactors and micronutrients found in nature. Therefore, I take emu oil. It is the highest naturally occurring food source for vitamin K2, MK4. This is a superstar nutrient. Also, it has omega-3, 6, 7, and 9, vitamin D3, and the vitamin E, all in one single supplement. So, you take it internally, 
but of course you can also use it for the skin it is awesome for sunburn insect bites yeah i really love the supplement all these symptoms are not normal but if the adrenals are weak that's when you really have the big problems so what you really need to do is support the adrenals before menopause and try to keep your stress as low as possible that's going to probably help you more than anything estrogen not only comes from the ovary and from the adrenals it comes from your own fat so depending on how much weight you're going to have you're going to have certain levels of estrogen so this could literally just go down slightly maybe down maybe i don't know 30 percent maybe even 20 percent making this difference here this ratio even worse so the real situation is this the adrenals are just not backing up these ovaries right here so number one support the adrenals before menopause but some of you watching are actually after menopause so what do you do in that situation well you do not go on a low-fat diet do not lower your dietary cholesterol why because all of these hormones are made out of cholesterol that's the precursor so if you actually go on a low-fat diet low cholesterol diet you are going to negatively influence these hormones all right number three counter high cortisol because the adrenals are acting to support the ovaries you're going to get a spike in cortisol okay that spike in cortisol is very damaging for in, in several ways one is it destroys your bone that's why women after menopause sometimes develop osteopenia and even osteoporosis and they get atrophy it looks like cellulite but it's really uh, a loss of muscle which you're getting this atrophy or loose muscle tissue and it looks like it's all fat but it's not it's just basically a loss of muscle tissue and it's kind of sagging in the body that is thanks to cortisol cortisol also affects the sleep cycle and it also releases uh, stored sugar, so it raises insulin. It turns your own body proteins, especially the thigh and the leg muscles and your butt muscles, into glucose, which then triggers insulin. This is why after menopause, it's very difficult because of the darn cortisol that's raising the insulin. So I put some links down below on all sorts of things you can do to support the adrenals, but you definitely need to get on healthy keto and intermittent fasting to keep the insulin in check that's your best bet for helping you lose weight and also helping you correct a very slow metabolism